Chepir is also one of the traditional games that are available in Malaysia. This game was played by kids of old because they did not have any games like today. This game is also known as Jentik, Tutup Botol, Tutup Orin, or Kepieng. The game is almost identical in shape to play Koba, but the materials used are different. The history of Chepe is that this game uses bottle caps. Additionally, these bottle caps are taken from soy sauce bottles or any bottles that use steel bottle caps. This game consists of two players or more and five pieces of bottle caps are used in the game. Chepair is a popular game from around 1970 until 1980. It is one of the traditional games often played by children. The way to play the game is determined by counting the number of successful chepair available during the waiting chepair. The method of play is almost the same as Batu Seremban. The game is widely played by boys with the involvement of two players and more. So, the equipment of Chepe is only 5 pieces of bottle caps. This game needs 5 steel caps or Chepe. This game needs more players to make this game more exciting and interesting. Players need to fix any points that they want to achieve and all the players need to agree with it. Whoever achieves to collect the points first will be the winner. Player will determine the rotation by lob action. The players who lob the caps and get a big number of caps get the advantage to start the game. One piece of chepe will be considered to two points. Player will spin the chepe to play. Make sure each piece of chepe is not overlapped. If the allocation meets the criteria of the rule, the game can be continued with one of the chepe which are scattered. If choices have been made, the other player needs to decide which chepe should be flipped. If the player succeeds, the player needs to lock the chepe to get a point. Each player needs to remember his own point and if the player is cheating about his point, his point is considered zero. Normally, this game needs supporters to remember their point from any carelessness. If the player do not succeed, the next player will make their move. Players need to collect their points according to the condition. Winner will be determined by the total points that player gets which has been fixed at the early game. Hello, I'm Nura Achara Bente Azidi, 1191-200262 from class MPU 3323, Intro to Multicultural Studies in Malaysia, would like to present a traditional game played in Malaysia that is called Selambut often referred to as Batu Seremban or Seremban. North and East Coast of Peninsular are referred to as Selambut, whereas Seremban game is found on the West Coast. Typically, it is played in teams of 2 or 2-5 person. Games played in Batu Seremban simply require a few fruit pieces or rubber seeds, pebbles or small stone, fragment of other often used round objects and occasionally as many as five seeds. Additional, the soup fabric bag that is filled with sand, saga seed and others is also employed. The game is frequently played for fun on a clean flat surface such as porch, inside a building, at a park or anywhere else. The players sit on the floor and play in turns. Now, I'm going to explain how to play Batu Seremban game. In this game, we required 5 small stones. You will be needing 2 or more people to play this game. There are multiple levels or various methods to celebrate in the Batu Seremban game, starting with a straightforward essential stage when a piece of fruit is employed. The game progresses to a more challenging level or top level of 7 names.
Hello, my name is Alia Maisara Binti Mohamad Fairuz and my student ID is 119-110-1726 and I am from Faculty of Management. Painting is a traditional game that has been played by previous generations. There are two theories found related to the history of painting. The first theory is that painting was created by Roman soldiers to train their soldiers. It is said that the training cart was about 100 feet in size and Roman soldiers trained in the cart wearing full armor to train physical strength, agility and mental strength. The second theory is that this game is originated in China and it is more similar to modern Teng Teng. First of all, to play Teng Teng, you need to have a stone. After that, you need to throw the stone and look closely where the stone lands. You need to jump using only one leg and avoid the box where the stone lands. Your other leg cannot touch the box or you will have to start again from the first box. Your leg cannot touch the box where the stone lands or you will have to start from the beginning. Hello there, my name is Osama and I am from Pakistan. And today I will be telling you about a very famous board game in my home country that is referred to as Ludo. Now, Ludo is actually a very common game, not only in Asia, but also in Europe, also in Africa, and also certain territories in the Americas, and etc. Now, Ludo is traditionally a four-player game, and I became acquainted with this game when I used to travel back home to Pakistan, and whenever I met my cousins, basically, we used to play it together. This was the best way to pass the time, and trust me. In Pakistan, basically, without electricity, there's electricity problems in Pakistan, by the way, Without electricity, this is the best form of enjoyment that you can possibly enjoy in Pakistan. Now, I will be giving you a basic run-through of the game. So as you can see, it's actually a four-player game. However, since I'm the only one here, I will be joined by my guests, who will actually be commanding the other colors. Now, each player gets to pick their favorite color. Well, it doesn't matter if it's your favorite. It can be any color, as long as it's a color. So basically, each player gets to pick their own color. And whenever you pick your own color, you will actually command the, the pieces on these boards. Now I will be giving you a more in-depth analysis of the game. So now I will be giving you a more in-depth analysis of the game itself, as well as the many rules of engagement that there are. Now the most basic rule of engagement in Ludo is that you have to get these pieces out of your own colored zone. If they stay here the whole game, you're not going anywhere and you will automatically lose the game. This is where all pieces are actually in their home territories. Blue represents the blue zone, that means all the blue pieces belong in this zone. The yellow one, the green one, the red ones, etc. In order to get these pieces out, you actually need to score a 6 with the die. Now the number can be anything, and I mean literally anything. So you have to score a 6, otherwise you will not be able to get your pieces out and there are actually instances of people that never managed to get a 6 and they lost the game because their pieces could never leave the dock. So, I will try and get a 6 on my first try. Well, if at first you don't succeed, try again and keep trying. Hmm. Maybe third time's a charm. Or perhaps not. We will keep doing this as many times as it takes until we score a six. Because without sixes, our pieces cannot leave this here. So we will do this as many times as it takes. Oh yeah, one more thing I forgot to mention is each player only gets one try. Now whenever you spin your die, the turn automatically passes to the next player, who in this case is the red team. And then once he's done, however, there is actually one rule. If you manage to score two sixes, that actually gives you another round. That means you can actually spin the die twice in a row. However, if you were to manage to get two sixes again the second time in a row, you can spin it again. And as long as you keep theoretically get it, if you keep getting sixes and sixes, you can basically just keep spinning the die as many times as you'd like. So basically, whenever you get a six, you can actually take a piece out. Depending on how many sixes that you got, for example, over here, I managed to get two sixes. So with two sixes, I, I have two options, basically. I can either take one piece out, 
and then travel six paces. Or well, another strategy, and I would, I would actually recommend this strategy, is that you take more of these pieces out because you never know when or where you're gonna get a six. Getting like sixes in this game, it's actually really difficult and there are many players that can actually never even get a six the entire game. So now that the pieces are out, there's actually the way to win is that you have to take these pieces, you have to travel all the way from here, these colored panels indicate you know your character. And these are actually the enemy zones. You actually have to go through this zone. So you have to travel from here, all the way from here, until you reach this point. Now over here, for example, I'm standing over here. If I score a 4, I will not land over here. Instead, I will land over here. And the reason why is because this is actually the victory zone. Once you can get your piece inside this zone, it can actually it cannot be harmed. And one thing that I forgot to mention is that these color pad panels on the board, these are actually safe zones, meaning that your pieces are actually safe over here from the other enemies. Now, for example, basically, if I was over here, and the enemy had one piece over here, and they were to score a one with their dice, this would actually eliminate this piece from the game, and they will go back to the zone, where then they will have to score another 6 in order to get out. However, there are basic rules and strategies that you can use in order to maximize your enjoyment of the game. For example, one really common strategy is to take one piece, people travel halfway across the board, until they reach a safe zone. Now for example, if I were to reach this place, or this place, over here, my die will be safe as long as it stays there. And normally what people do is they travel the entire board with a single die, with a single piece, and once it reaches the safe zone, they actually start to concentrate on getting these ones over there. So that's actually a really good strategy in Ludo, is that you want to maximize as many pieces you have on the board, and you, want, you also want to maximize the number of pieces in safe zones. These are the ideal locations your pieces need to be. Now, there's also a few other strategies that can be used in order to keep your pieces safe. For example, if an enemy were waiting for me over here, and both of my pieces were in this area, and I were to score... Well, I didn't get it, but let's say I was able to score 2-1. That would mean I can I can move one piece either two steps, or I can move two pieces one step. So when I do this, they actually form a uh, like a sort of barrier that protects them from damage. Meaning that if the enemy player were to get a one, they actually won't be able to eliminate either of these pieces. However, there is one circumstance where they one of these pieces can be eliminated. For example, if I were to get a 2 and a 1, basically, basically what would happen is I would move this one, one, like one step ahead, and for example, I decided to move this one two steps ahead. Now since this is the only piece here, he will be eliminated because he is at the bottom, and he's vulnerable. So whenever you get a 2 and a 1, and you find yourself in this position, I would recommend that you instead try and move both of those pieces instead. So those are all the strategies of Ludo. I, I haven't yet explained how, to, how you win the game. So basically how you win the game is, as I mentioned earlier, you have to get all four of your pieces out here. On one of, It can be any of these places, it can even be here. And the way to victory is whenever you whenever your your piece enters this area, it's obviously safe as I mentioned earlier. However, basically over here, if you can score a five with one die, you'll be able to move this piece five steps, and this piece will actually help you score a point. In order to win the game, you have to score four points, and these points can be scored by having all four of your pieces in the center of the arena. Once that happens, you win the game. However, you have to keep in mind, there will be instances where you're very close to victory, 
like for example over here I have this one piece three of I, I already have three points however in a stroke of bad luck the enemy managed to score a six with his dice that means they'll be able to move this one six steps and this means that I will have to go all the way back here I'll have to score a six again if I can and then only then I'll be able to get this piece out so you have to be very careful about especially this area once you cross the halfway area of this board, you have to be super, super careful. Otherwise, one mistake can cost you the whole game. So, thank you very much. That was my explanation for Ludo. I hope you enjoyed it and found it informative. Thank you very much. This game is also known as Killering. One game involves drawing a circle in the sun, and the players will take turn knocking other players marble out of the circle with their marble. This game is called Ringer, but is also known by other names. Other versions involve shooting marbles at target marbles or into holes in the ground. The main goal is to end up with the most marbles at the end of the game. Each player brings his set of marbles to use and potentially loses. This is considered playing of kips or kipses. Playing field. Draw a circle measuring 10 feet in diameter uh, uh, according to tournament rules and a starting or leg uh, line. The leg line is drawn just outside of the circle or ring. How to play? To start the game, each player must sweep his marbles into the hole master. The marbles into the hole or the near set permanent is treated as the first player started the game, and thus marbles are followed by almost a second and so on the first player will fix the marbles to all the marbles that are in the air of a circle that out if the falc does not hit it uh, is it assumed dead and the second player will make a fall to those marbles are there and so on until all players complete phelps over other players members players can release the turn but on the condition that is must include the marbles into the hole holding his first the player will ensure his marbles always be close to the hole every time the parent phillips done this makes it easier to control his, uh, the game. Each ex exchange turn to the next player and the player who took his turn is required to enter the marble into the hole before flaking holding the opponent's marbles. If the marbles don't, don't go into the holding hole, turn to the other, uh, other players given. Scoring is based on the large number of flips made against the opponent's marbles until all players finish their turn. Two-way fans are levied against a player who collect the lowest amount. The player will lose his marbles in the hole in string. The parent and all players will crosses marbles the second way is for each player to once flick the lost marbles away from the circle hello everyone today i'm going to talk about one of the traditional games in asia which is gassing gassing is a type of game that can spin on its own axis while balancing on one point Gassing is also a traditional game in Malaysia since a memorial time and, and they also usually play Gassing after harvest season So Gassing is played and contested between villages 
and the winners are decided based on how long the how long the length of time the gasing is able to spin. The gasing are made from babaru, kemuning, merbau, rambai, durian, or kondang wood. Uh, the wood will be notched and scrapped until it becomes a gasing shape. While the rope, the gasing rope is made from a uh, new tree bark, but usually now the rope is made from a uh, nylon rope. And it is usually depends on a uh, person, the length depends on a uh, person's end. Usually it is one meter long. And also, coconut oil is used to smooth the movement of the gasing. The method of playing gasing uh, now and before is not much different. Before 1970, gasing games in Malaysia uh, are not organized and differ between one district to another. Uh, various shapes, size and uses of gassing distinguish the gassing properties and form a different game system. So when you bought gassing for the first time, you will get one gassing and then one rope. So for the rope, it has two ends. For, so for the first end, you need to tie a dead knot, so for for the rope to not break. So we will tie it real quick. Just a simple dead knot at the end of the rope. Something like this. So when the rope will start to break, it will only break at the end of the rope. So for the another end, you need to tie it so you can put a finger inside the rope. Let me tie it real quick. It's actually hard. Okay. So when you when you tie it like this, you can move it. Adjust it based on the finger size, something like this. So the way to play it is actually quite easy, but you need a lot of training to to throw it, to throw the gasing and make it spin. So for the ring finger just slide it in like this and then you tighten it up okay and for the other this is the end the one that I tied just now so I will show you guys how to wrap the rope on the seat so you need to the dead knot need to be on top of the gasing something like this and then you hold it then you pull so I say to make a spin you just oops spin keep spinning keep spinning until it's done and then the way you want to hold it is your middle finger is on top of the gassing and your thumb finger is on the nail. So it pretty much look like this. So this is how the gassing will look like after you have uh, tied the rope. So now I'm going to show you guys how to throw the gassing. So I have showed you guys how to throw the gassing. So the standard way of um, people playing it is 
itu uh, winners are decided by how long the gassing will spin and for example the other way is uh, people will make a ring and five people will throw the gassing and knock knock out the gassing that's all from me thank you Assalamualaikum and good evening my name is Muhammad Shafi Irshad My student ID is 11911100832. I'm from Faculty of Creative Multimedia FCM and I'm from Project Group 2. So today I will be demonstrating a traditional game in Malaysia called Dam Haji or Malaysian Checkers. It is believed that this game came from French around 12th century called Alquerque. Later than around 1535 A new rule was added where the players must eliminate the opponent's piece whenever they have the chance. This is done so that the game will become more interesting. It is also said that Dam Haji was originally came from a Dutch game called Dammen. This is possible since that the Dutch used to colonize Malaysia in 1641, leaving the Dutch influence to be absorbed into the Malaysian culture. So that is the history of Dam Haji. So the first thing you want to do is you line up all of the pieces on this black tie. So each player will get 12 pieces of points. Usually the first player who gets to start will use the black pawn. So how you want to move is that you move diagonally forward. So either this way or this way and you cannot move backward. To eliminate the opponent's pawn is that Yeah, you have to make sure there is an empty square behind the opponent's pawn. So all you have to do is you take your pawn and jump over your opponent's pawn. So you have eliminated this opponent's pawn. So you take it and put it on your side. So next is that you can eliminate opponent's pawn, ah, uh, multiple pawn in one time. For example, alright. So for example, is that you move. Like this, one, two. So you have eliminated two of the opponent's pawns at one time. Okay. Next is that if you move to the end of the board of the opponent side, you will become Haji or the King. So how to differentiate this pawn from the other is that you have to flip it over or take the opponent's. Pawn and put it on your on your top of your pawn. So this is the haji. So the advantage of haji is that you can move backward and forward, but only by one square. There is also another version of haji, another version of dam haji in an alternate multiverse where you can move uh, from one square to another square. From a long distance, for example, if you want to take out this opponent's pawn, even that you are far away from the opponent's pawn, you can still take out uh, this one. So, for example, from here to here, but that is only in the version of Dam Haji called Haji Terbang. Terbang in English means fly, fly. If the opponent can move, so you will get the chance to move. So it is your turn. Once you have eliminated all of the opponent's pawn, you have taken all of the opponent's pawn, you will be considered the winner. So that's it from me. Thank you for watching. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Shafi Zakri bin Sharizal. Uh, my student ID is one two zero one two zero three five three five. So I'm from uh, Faculty uh, uh, Computer and Informatics. So today I would like to uh, talk about uh, Malaysian traditional games, uh, which is Chongkak. So uh, Chongkak is a Mangkula game of uh, Malay origin, played in Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, so Southern Thailand, and also some parts of Sumatra, Sumatra and Borneo. The word chongkak was believed originated uh, from uh, the old Malay chongak 
uh, give meaning as uh, mental calculation that was practiced in this game. Uh, it was considered that a good player will have an advantage in collecting points to win the game when the player calculates a few steps in advance. Okay, so the history of Shonka is uh, the oldest Shonka game that was found uh, in a abandoned castle of Roman Egypt back to the 4th century AD. This game was slightly introduced to Southeast Asia by Indian uh, or Arab traders uh, in 15th century. It was spread all over Malay world through the dealer, through the dealers, dealers via Malacca where at that time the trading post is very important. Uh, early years back then it was thought about the, that the game was for the king and queen, uh, family residents only. But it was spread to the general population of the kingdom later on. Other than Malays, the Indian Peranakan also loved this traditional game. So the objective of playing Chongka is to get rid of all the seats by moving them across your over your enemy while placing each of your seat or marbles into your own uh, house or pit or store we call it so the games and where the winner either the one with the most seats or with the less seats so the winner <coughs> will have the more seats so if you move uh, until the final steps, then you have more seats, then you will become the winner. Uh, Chonka requires uh, two equipment, which is uh, the Chonka board and the marbles. Or um, uh, uh, the alternative is uh, rubber seats. Okay, so how to play Chonka? Uh, so the Chonka board consists of two rows of seven holes. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, called the houses, and two bigger storehouse. This and this. Before the game starts, uh, each houses need seven marbles or rubber seed. So uh, Chongka plays with uh, can play with two players. So how to start is both both player will uh, start continue, uh, together. So I'll start. Okay, so I finish at my store. Then I can pick any of uh, this uh, house that I want from my side. So I pick this one. So I stop here, I pick, I pick up another pick up another house and I move but I don't store in the opponent uh, store So when uh, I put my last uh, marble inside my own uh, house I can take this Open in house as a gift and put it in my store. And then uh, the opening will start the next round. So if the opening uh, finish, uh, for example here also, then he cannot take any from any houses, and then I can start moving. From any house, from any house, from my side. Uh, so, as you can see, this is the result of the playing. So, like I have only two marble steps, so I'm gonna move. I'm gonna finish my step. Okay. So after uh, opponents and my houses are empty, then we will calculate the stores. So, uh, to state whether we win or we, we lose is based on how many marbles that we store in our store so if my marble is 
is uh, as the higher percentage, then I'll, I'll, I'll win the chongkat game. Assalamualaikum. My name is Muhammad Akil bin Muhammad Razaidi. My student ID is 12013031169. I am from the Faculty of Creative Multimedia. And today I will be presenting about Galapanjang. Galapanjang is a game that many of us have played when we were young. The traditional game is known by various names in Malaysia, including Toy and Belon Acha. While local traditional game practitioners uh, cannot really pinpoint the origin of the game, it is said to have been played in Malaysia for a long time and uh, gained popularity back in 1960s. Um, in ancient Kerala, a southern state in India, the game was also a part of their military training of it because of its close resemblance to the martial art form of Kalari Payattu. There is a strong possibility that Gala Panjang has its roots from Kilihattu. It was a popular pastime during the Chola dynasty. At the height of its influence, Rajendra Chola had successfully invaded the cities of the Srivijaya Kingdom in both Malaysia and Indonesia. It could be that Chola soldiers brought the game here and over the passing time, it became a traditional Malaysian game. So I've prepared a small diagram to explain how to play Galapanjang. So there's two sides to this game. There's the attacking side and the defending side. Uh, you have to get at least several people to join you on this game. Um, because it's not a one player, one player game. So you need more, more than one person to play this game. You make two groups. One becomes the attacker, one becomes the defender. So the attacking side, uh, their objective is uh, they must go from one end of the court to the other end without getting tagged out by the defenders. And uh, what the defenders must do is they must stay on uh, their own set line, this line right here, their own set line. Uh, and they can only move um, on the line. So they can only move up like this and down like this. And then there's going to be one guy in the middle where he moves uh, sideways like this. That's his direction of movement. So these defenders must defend the um, final, final line right here because once the attackers pass the final line, they're safe. So they must tag out the attackers uh, before they get to the final line. So um, how, how a run would go is that maybe the first guy right here, he would, uh, he would go in uncontested. And then on the second line, he would have um, these two defenders guarding him. Uh, defender number one here and defender number two. Both of them will guard him and won't let him get an easy um, you know, entrance past them. So you can't really go this way because both of them are guarding. So you have to, it's like mind games. You have to juke them out somehow. And uh, somehow to, you know, if the if the person attacking is fast enough, maybe you could bolt through, you know. Done. Easy. Second area. Also, I kind of forgot to explain that while this is going on, while the first guy is like running through and everything, um, it's not like a turn-based game. Everyone can go at once. All like, all the attackers can go at once. So, while the first guy could be in the second area, like between the first line and the second line, um, while that guy is like doing the uh trying to juke out the people, you know, all the other attackers might see it as an uh, opportunity for them to go past the first guy because the first guy is like too busy trying to, you know, catch the first attacker. So, yeah. So on this second area, maybe the defending guy is like faster than the first guy, the first attacker guy. So maybe just the defending guy uh, tags him out. So what happens when an attacker gets tagged out is they just wait out. They just wait outside here on the side. 
just wait until the game is over. It either uh either the game ends with um a lot of the players are on this a lot of the attackers are on this side of the court or they got tagged out and have to wait on the side. So yeah, that's all to me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Muhammad Duhaikal bin Nurul Hadi. My ID is 12013031172. So I would like to introduce my game is called Lelayang or another name is Wow. Lelayang is an object made of thin or paper like sheet that is flown or float into the air while being attached to a string or string that is held on the ground. When the when the wind moves around the Lelayang body, low pressure is created above it and high pressure is created below it. Layang-layang get lift from this pressure difference. To make it simpler, to direct the layang-layang while it is being carried by the wind. This is layang from externally has a tail and head. Nowadays, a tall layang still have a place among the Malay community. Layang have also received attention from the local and international community. Various shape and pattern of kite have been created have been killed. There are people shoot kite, net sheep, and some are playing using two strings. Most Lalayang shows still have a place in Malaysia, especially during festival day or international Lalayang competition. So, I would like to share how to play a Lalayang Lalayang. Usually, the Lalayang be played by two people, namely a conductor who hold the Lalayang and puller who hold the rope. When the wind blow, when the wind blow, the rope will be pulled against the wind by stretching and pulling the rope until the line layang is high in the air. Objective to play the layang layang is the flying time. In other way there is competition to choose the most beautiful line layang shape. It is evaluated for aesthetic value based on the question size, color, pattern and unique case. So, I will show you demo how to play Layang Layang. Hello and Assalamualaikum. My name is Atira binti Abdul Latif, and for this final project, I'm gonna be talking about um this game called Chapte. So Chapte is a traditional game famous in Southeast Asia, and this game probably best remembered by young boys who spend hours kicking this usually colorful feathered toy, and the shuttlecock 
which is called a jianzi in the Chinese game and also known in English as a Chinese hacky sack or kinja, typically has four colorful feathers fixed into a rubber sole or plastic discs. Some handmade jianzis uh, make use of a washer or a coin with a hole in the center. So how to play chapte? So during play, it's actually pretty simple and straightforward. So during play, various parts of the body, except for the hands, are used to keep the shuttlecock from touching the, the ground. And it is primarily balanced and propelled upwards using parts of the leg, especially the feet. So skilled players may employ a powerful overhead kick. The history of Chapte. So the Chapte's origin is believed to date back to the 5th century before Christ in China and the Chinese fondly called it Ti Jianzi which is which directly translates to kick shuttlecock. So the earlier version of the game has a football like nature and was used in a military training. So over the centuries the game gained popularity around Asia and soon around the world. Um, in recent years, the game has gained a formal following in around the globes. In English, both of the sports and the object with which it is played are referred to as a shuttlecock or feather ball. The game is also popular in Malaysia, where it is known as chapte. So in the next video, you're going to see a demonstrate on how to play chapte by my brother because he likes to play it and he's really good at it so enjoy that's all from me now thank you Hi and Assalamualaikum, my name is Cik Lutfi Arif bin Cik Mustafa and my student ID number is 119110 and 1971 and I'm from the Faculty of Creative Multimedia. So today I would like to share about my traditional game that I chose which is football paper. This game is quite common and familiar for us especially during our primary school. Usually this game is played by male players since it is a football game. This game is so simple. Basically, it is just the same as we play the real football game. The main target of this game is just to get a ball into the goal to get a score. I'm not really sure if this game is actually a traditional game or just a childhood game, but I do some research and analysis from the Google and they said that it is a traditional game too. For me, this game is quite interesting because you can play football but you don't really have to play it at a field. Maybe you can play it at a classroom, any playroom or any places that have a table or any surfaces that you can put this game on. And also this game teach you how to do an origami things since this game made out of origami technique to create those players and go. The rules of this game are just as familiar as the actual football game, which players can kick the ball by pressing the paper players, but you can't move the player just like that. If the ball is near to that certain paper player, then you can move them towards the ball. Basically the nearest one. You can also give the ball to your player partner in case they are the nearest to the goal of the opponent player. The paper players also can be direct to any direction of the paper player they want. Let's say they want to kick the ball to the left corner, so they move the paper player to the left. If the opponent get a point, then you can start first on the second round or vice versa. Also, you can get a free kick if the ball get out from the actual limit space of the game. Usually, a table is the watermark of the limitation.
Turn up in it bad, baby, I'm not your dad It's not all you want from me I just want your company Call it up for you, sell it for the end room And we'll apart a bit, don't look so confused And you're not starting it, now I'm in a mood Now we all can rain in my bedroom We play games of love to avoid the depression We've been here before and I won't be your victim Why are you always in the mood? So thank you so much for watching my demonstration of the paper football. I hope you enjoy my explanation of this game. You can also try to make it with your friends or family. So I think that's all for me. Thank you. Bye.